What's going on, man? How you doing? Good, good. Just another day in paradise. That's cool, man. Thanks for coming on this. Yeah, um, no worries. You, uh, so you and your family have a long history in Pinellas County, and especially in the fishing community. Mm -hmm. um, give us a little background on that real quick. Yeah, uh, Hubbard's Marina is our family business. Uh, we've mm -hmm. been fishing local waters for uh, over 90 years and four generations. Uh, my grandfather started our company in uh, four, with seven rowboats and 14 cane poles. And uh, over 90 years later, we're uh, doing anything from two inches of water out past a thousand foot. We have uh, 12 different vessels operating in our fleet, uh, six of those being federally permitted offshore fishing vessels. Uh, four of those six are private charter vessels, and then two are party boat trips, uh, or party boat vessels. And uh, we've been very uh, blessed to be able to grow as a family business and sustain um, success by just doing our best to stay ahead of the curve and uh, really trying to give back to the community while also trying to stay active in the fisheries management arena. Because uh, nowadays it's becoming more and more important to be active and up to date with what's going on and the federal fisheries management level uh, as fisheries become more and more accountable. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very important to try to stay ahead of the curve and know what's coming uh, as is evident in the commercial fishery. So you guys you guys started in john's pass right which is one of the main main ports in pinellas county or no or we started from uh what was then called hubbard's pier and okay. uh, uh it was eighth avenue in pass grill mm -hmm. and uh back in those days uh john's pass wasn't really uh a thing too much because most people lived in gulfport and then they would take a ferry over to pass a grill mm -hmm. uh so pass a grill and terra verde as well so pass a grill was kind of the hub and everybody went to pass a grill so that's where we actually started and when my grandfather first started it was just him but over time he had uh six or seven uh charter boat vessels operating out of there behind world war one is when we got our first uh motor driven uh charter boat and uh that that world war one really enabled a lot of the charter fleet and fishing fleet in our area to become motor powered uh, because it made the combustion engine so much widely uh accessible and affordable and that's kind of when things blew up in our area and fishing really became what people traveled to our area for. And uh, in the early 60s is when we started running our party boats. Uh, in 1967, we were actually the first uh, on the entire uh, west coast of Florida to offer overnight long range party boat fishing trips. Uh, we were the first wow. to operate a private charter vessel uh, here in the central west Florida area. Uh, we invented the half day fishing trip uh, back in the early 60s. And um, over time, it's just, again, just blessed to stay ahead of the curve. Nowadays, we operate the first uh, and one of a kind hydrofoil assisted U.S. Coast Guard inspected uh, catamaran. So it's actually a, a go fast charter boat that rides on a wing above the water. Uh, it's pretty unique. What? And, oh, yeah. When did you crazy. get that? Uh, we just got that uh, a few years ago. It's been about two and a half years we've been operating that vessel. Uh, we had it built custom uh, out of Louisiana area, and uh, we got the plans from someone in South Africa. The scientist had uh, devised it, and a lot of people use that uh, same technology on six-pack boats or what's called an uninspected vessel because when you carry six passengers or less, you don't have to be Coast Guard inspected, whereas if you carry that seven or more passengers, you have to be Coast Guard inspected, which basically means you have to draw up plans of the naval engineer. You have to send it off to uh, MSO in Washington, D.C., which is like the head of the Coast Guard. Yeah. Takes oh, them a few months to sign off on the plans. Yeah, picture that thing. Yeah, and what's it uh, called? The Flying Hub Two. You can find it on our website. Flying Hub Two. On yeah. your website. That's mm -hmm. insane. And uh, basically, I don't know why I've never heard of this. Oh, it's a wild boat. It's beautiful. It sounds super expensive. It, <laughs> it was very. Expensive. How, how much is it? Can you tell us? Uh, it was uh, cl just shy of a million dollars. What? Yeah. Yeah. If you close that and then go to private charters, okay, and then Flying Hub Two, you'll see the photos of her. Got a little. Uh, photo gallery as it looks 40 here. by 14 
Yeah, it's a, a, a very fast boat, and uh, it can actually take uh, up to 20 passengers uh, out fishing at about 33 Damn. knots, which equates to about 40 miles an hour. Uh, so it's just a wild <laughs> boat. And when it gets back, this uh, slideshow, when it gets back to the front, you'll see the boat uh, cruising at speed, and it actually comes up on the wings, so it rides above the water. Here is how a boat normally rides, which the water line you can see uh, is just at a normal distance from the water, and it's just cruising in the water. Right. But when it gets up to a certain speed, those hydrofoils actually lift the boat. So right there, that's not the boat hitting a wave. That's the boat riding it just rides on the wing. Like that. And what's the benefit of it being like that? Is it faster, uh, smoother? Yeah, or? there's less hydrodynamic drag, so only the back quarter of the boat is actually touching the surface of the water. Okay. Uh, so without all that water dragging on the hull, you have a lot more efficiency, the boat's a lot more quiet, and you have a lot more speed, and you can carry more weight more efficiently. Uh, normally a boat like that, uh, with 20 passengers on it, you wouldn't be able to go 40 miles an hour. Okay. Uh, and that boat only has 350 horsepower engines. It's got two of them. So two it's only, of them, right? Do you yeah. know how it looks like? Yeah, so it's actually got two Mercuries on it now. Oh, really? Yeah, but with 700 horsepower to push 20 people at 40 miles an hour is pretty, uh, I mean, no one does that. So right. people just go on that for, for what? I mean, do you fish on that boat? Or yeah. Is that yeah, we do a lot of uh, offshore fishing on it. We do uh, private charters on it. It's mainly a private charter fishing vessel. Right. Um, but we do have a public split charter style trip on uh, Wednesday and Sundays. We do a 12 hour extreme where you're fishing 70 to 100 miles from shore. You get about seven to eight hours fishing time and you get a uh, serious chance for some really big fish. Oh, yeah. And it's only 300 bucks. So nice. to wow. get 70 to 100 miles out and fish that long, it's, it's a pretty unique option. That's awesome. Awesome. So do you actually run these boats yourself? Yeah, yeah, I operate all the vessels in our fleet. Uh, I'm the vice president and uh, co-owner of Hubbard's Marina, and I'm uh, really involved in the day-to-day -day operations. So unfortunately, I don't get to uh, go out and play on the water as much as I would like. But right. running the boat to me is a, a lot like having a day off work because it's a lot of fun. But right. unfortunately, a lot of times I'm stuck in the office, especially this time of year when we have a lot of admin stuff to do for the following year. But when we get busy and we need a captain uh, or when something unique's going on, uh, I typically uh, am called up for it. So I run a lot of our shark fishing trips, and then uh, I run a lot of private charters where clients request me. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. What kind of people... What, what's the majority of the customers that come to you guys? Are they fishing people or are they people just looking to go on a party boat? Or It really depends on the trip. I mean, we run anything from sunset cruises to dolphin watches to island trips to snorkeling yeah. to shelling to fishing. In our fishing trips, we do a 5, uh, 10, 12, 39, 44, and 63-hour mm -hmm. trip. So it really depends on the trip uh, and also the client because we also have private charters that we could do anywhere from three to 72 hours. So like on a 63 hour trip, we'll have people flying in from California, New York, yeah. uh, all over. Chicago, really? all, all, yeah. Even we had a guy the other day that traveled from the UK to do our 39 hour trip. So on those longer trips, it's more advanced anglers who are looking to go catch some big fish or have the opportunity uh, to go catch some big fish. Right. Whereas on our five-hour trip, there's a lot more families and just people to looking to go out for and the day get, and stuff. Yeah, what a line! Right. So it's it's very interesting to me to see the evolution of the angler. You have the guy that just wants to learn how to f catch a fish and he's ecstatic to just hook one. Right. Yeah. And then Anything. you have yeah. <laughs> then you have the guy that's learned how to do it and really thinks he's got it figured out, but he's still struggling a little bit and he's happy if he catches a few. Then you got the guy who He's he's got it all down pat. You can't teach him nothing, and yeah. all he wants to do is kill them all, fill yeah, a cooler, get them all. Yeah. And then you got the guy that's done that for a long time and is realizing that hey, we got to put some of these back, and he's more right. catch and release oriented. And he's just out there to have a good time and enjoy the water. And then you get to a certain point where fishing is uh, fishing yourself is kind of overrated. I would rather sit out there and show you how to catch a fish and watch right. you catch a fish. Uh, and I really enjoy getting kids hooked on fishing and people uh, who don't know how to fish, uh, trying to get them hooked on fishing and become more effective offshore because it can get frustrating. I mean, especially offshore fishing, 
if you got your own boat, you spent 20, 30, 40, even $100,000 on this boat, you got to put 200, 300 gallons of fuel in it. So, I mean, you're, you have to invest a thousand dollars a lot of times to get offshore and go fishing. Yeah. And if you spend a thousand dollars and you go out there and you don't catch any fish and you had a right. terrible time, you can't anchor on your spot. You're, you're, you're not, not going to want to keep doing it. Right. Yeah. 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 So that's uh, what I really enjoy is kind of teaching people how to be more effective. And that's really what we kind of put an emphasis on is just uh, furthering our industry, conserving our fishery and, uh, teaching people how to get hooked on fishing when That's you say cool. conserving the your fishery what do you mean by fishery like i guess what is a fishery our fishery in the gulf of mexico is it what that means is uh, just the whole industry as a whole our fishery supports not only uh, our waterfront uh, coastal economies and working waterfronts but it also uh, supports a lot of families and a lot of businesses and a lot of people's access to uh, the Gulf of Mexico and the fish we catch. Mm -hmm. The fishery is kind of an overarching umbrella term to oh, okay. refer to any type of fishing activities or fishing related biz businesses. Um, because a recreational angler like yourself, someone who's not commercial fishing, someone who doesn't own a party boat, you have a few different ways to access the fishery. You can go stand on a seawall, go down to a fishing pier, yeah. you could go buy your own boat or go with a buddy, yeah. or you can have an opportunity to go on a party boat or a charter boat. Okay. And uh, it really doesn't matter how you access the fishery, you're a recreational angler mm -hmm. uh, that looks for an opportunity to wet a line. And each yeah. sector of our fishery, we have commercial fishermen and then we have recreational fishermen. And when it comes to Red Snapper, we also have four higher recreational, which is charter boats and party boats. So to me, it doesn't matter how you access the fishery, you're yeah. still a recreational angler. And it's very interesting the differences in how we prosecute our fisheries when you're talking about a commercial guy, a for hire rec guy, or a private rec guy. Um, because a private rec guy, he's going out there for an opportunity to fill that cooler. He doesn't necessarily have to fill that cooler. His, 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 his benefit or the intrinsic value that he places on that uh, fishing trip isn't based on how full his cooler is. Uh, whereas a commercial guy, He's out there to fill the cooler. That's what he does. Right. And the only way he gets paid is if he does fill that cooler. Right. Um, so they totally view their trip a totally different way. And we all uh, prosecute our fisheries in different ways from the depth fish, the area fish, the length of the trip. And uh, then you have the party boat and charter boat guys, which we're giving those private rec guys a chance to access the fishery by providing the mode of transportation. But it's still the same idea. We're right. giving them that opportunity to fill the coolers. So the commercial guys need to be able to land a certain amount of fish and they need to be able to have that flexibility to do so. Whereas mm -hmm. the recreational guys, we just need access. We need days uh, at sea. And it doesn't necessarily mean if you, if I give you, if you have 200 pounds of fish to catch, a, rec, a commercial guy is going to go out there and catch it in one day. He's going to stay out, or one trip. He's okay. going to stay out there for a week if it takes him, and he's going to catch those fish. Yeah. Whereas a recreational guy, he might go fishing 10, 15, 20 times before he gets that 200 pounds because he's got to make it home for dinner or right. he's got to work tomorrow. Or whatever. Yeah, they don't stay out for weeks at a time like the commercial fishery. So right. it's very interesting when... Uh, the federal fisheries management and a lot of people approach our fishery and try to manage it as a whole when you really have to evaluate the modes and uh, evaluate the way in which we prosecute our fishery and the way we go about it because it's all so different. Yeah. So to me, conserving the fishery just means providing access to recreational anglers, giving the commercial anglers an opportunity to prosecute the fishery in which will most uh, benefit their businesses and allow the seafood industry to continue here in the nation because we have a huge seafood industry. Oh, yeah. Do you guys do anything with seafood? Uh, we do not. We're uh, strictly recreational. Okay. And uh, that's a little bit frustrating for me sometimes is a lot of people look at us and say, oh, you're a commercial fisherman. Well, we're not. The commercial fishermen have uh, these boats. They do extended trips and they sell their fish. Yeah. A recreational angler cannot sell their fish. Any fish caught on our boats doesn't matter how, when, what. They cannot be sold in any way legally. 
So we're not out there to sell catch fish and sell fish and make money on fish. Mm -hmm. We make money on the opportunity to catch that fish. So a guy comes out fishing with us or a girl comes out fishing with us for a chance to catch that fish. Right. Uh, and that's the way we make a living. So we're not commercial fishermen. We're recreational fishermen, uh, but we do it for hire. So that's why there's for hire recreational, <laughs> private recreational, and commercial. And those are the three sectors in our fishery currently. There doesn't seem like there's much competition. I mean, I don't know of anyone else doing what you guys are doing on the scale that you guys are doing it around there's, this area. There's 1,237 federally permitted charter boat and party boat vessels in the Gulf of Mexico right now. And uh, when you say charter boat, I mean, you mean strictly bringing people out to go fish and just catch fish, not for the purpose of selling it, just... Charter boats and party boats, recreational. yes. Do, they're right. for hire recreational. Right. They okay. do not sell their fish. And uh, Did you say in the whole state? In the Gulf of Mexico. In the Gulf of Mexico, mm -hmm. okay. But Florida has 40%. I, I don't recall the exact breakdown, but it's around 40% of those 1,237. And in our area alone, we have about seven to eight party boat vessels that fish out of Pinellas County. So there's uh, some pretty decent competition now as far as the scale of our business uh, a lot of other people have two party boats and a few charter boats uh there's yeah. two operations in clearwater that have the same kind of setup oh yeah uh, yeah and there's another place up in uh panama city beach florida uh that had the exact same operation we do really? multiple charter boats multiple party boats and dolphin watching shelling snorkeling all that yeah. so uh there's other people doing what we do but we try to set ourselves apart by uh, that customer service and that uh, a willingness to educate. Uh, if you go up to fishing trips on our website here, yep. uh, when you scroll down to the bottom there, from fishing tips and tricks to our fishing seminars, to our live stream shows, to the weather links, to the fishing rules, to the fishing reports, wow. all, all that information is for people whether they're fishing with us, they're fishing on their own boat, or they're fishing on someone else's boat. And that's how we try to set ourselves apart, is being that uh, source for people to try to learn more about fishing, get hooked on fishing, and then right. also we guarantee an excellent client experience with superior guest service, and we really try to go above and beyond. And I try to personally take that uh, to heart and really try to be there for a guest when they leave, be there for a guest when they come back. Yeah. We do confirmation emails, reminder emails, thank you emails. We do a pre-boarding seminar. We do a fishing seminar on the way out. Our crew and captains, a lot of these guys, we have one captain that's been there 25 years. We have uh, two crew members that have been working together as a team for 15 years. We've got one guy that's been there 14 years, and we try to foster that family-oriented, family-friendly uh, environment, and it really seems to carry out to our captains and crew. We've been really blessed to have just an outstanding team, and we've been able to keep them around, and that's how we set ourselves apart because – uh, in my uh, biased opinion, shout out to Shane Lee. Yeah, <laughs> in my, in no, my he doesn't he doesn't work for you. Just no. to clear it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a he's a he's a friend and he lives in the area. But yeah. no, it uh, the commercial fishery that that goes back to what I was saying earlier. It, it's just so different because uh, a guy like Shane Lee can catch fish and kill a ton of fish, and he's probably amazing at being out there and and catching fish but right mm -hmm. can that same individual go teach how to fish can that same individual <laughs> offer not. that excellent client can experience teach you how to do a few things i don't know if yeah. fishing is yeah <laughs> yeah and that's that's the thing is that that professional appearance that uh yeah. client experience right. and client service and then the ability to not only catch fish yourself but teach how to fish right and uh <laughs> that kind of separates a commercial fleet from the recreational or fire for hire recreational because on a commercial boat, there's no client on board. There's no, there's no right. uh, guest service, yeah. and uh, it's a very different industry. What is your perspective on? I mean, I'm, I know you've seen Deckhands, the series that we did. What is your perspective on on all those guys and that whole community as a whole, as far as the com commercial guys who go out for seven to ten days on a boat, yeah, and just recklessly you know, do whatever they do, get fucked up and then come back. And, you know, what is your perspective on that, that whole, that whole thing? 
Well, I mean, I grew up in Madeira Beach. I've lived on Madeira Beach my whole life, and I know a lot of these guys. And uh, some of the commercial fleet is uh, uh, some very good role models. And uh, guys like Bobby Spaeth, Martin Fisher, uh, Jason Dela Cruz, the, the, the shareholders, uh, the people that uh, have the allocation uh, that are business oriented, professional, and uh, they, they've done things right. They stayed ahead of the curve. And uh, the captains, Captain John Hood, there's, there's a ton of commercial captains that are completely clean cut, respectable, hardworking individuals. Not that Shane Lee and Space Lee aren't uh, hardworking individuals, but uh, the clean cut stuff, maybe not so much. Yeah. But it's, uh, in my view on the whole thing is, uh, it's, it it really depends on what you're doing and how you approach it. I mean, there's a lot of boats in Madeira Beach that have zero tolerance for drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. Then there's other boats in Madeira Beach where they each deckhand brings a, a little baggie of drugs and a case of beer and you kill it on the way out. And then it's sehab the rest of the trip. You're withdrawing yeah. and going through rehab, basically, and you're totally dry. And there's other boats that they sit out there and do heroin the whole time, you know, right. and uh everybody has their own approach to things and i think the guys who are doing it right uh i mean you can tell just standing on the end of my dock in john's pass i can see a boat and i i can tell that the captain cares and he gives a shit and the owner right. cares because you'll have a commercial boat that's beautiful painted just perfect right they, nice clean they, they take it to dry dock every year and they they scrub it and yeah. uh there's no rust on it and then you have a commercial boat go by that's looks <laughs> like it doesn't belong on the water and shouldn't float and yeah. that's just covered in rust and dingy and it looks like it hasn't been scrubbed in a year so uh my view on it is just like anything else you have your good apples you have your bad apples and uh unfortunately there's a few bad apples in every bunch and uh it's really changed and since the i'm only 27 years old and in my lifetime the commercial fishery has completely ev uh, evolved and and changed uh some might say for the worse some might say for the better but i mean when i was a kid uh madeira beach john's pass was a grouper capital of the world we had uh we had hundreds 500 plus uh grouper boats fishing out of Madeira Beach and going out there and catching a ton of fish and coming back. Nowadays, there's 50. So Why? there's been uh, regulation, regulation, yeah. tightening up the industry and, and consolidation. The IFQ system did exactly what it was set out to do, which was consolidate and make the fishery accountable. In the commercial fleet, it is ridiculous the amount of red tape they have to do. A commercial boat has What is to, red tape when you say that? Yeah, red tape. Because <laughs> I don't know this fishing term. Yeah. So I don't know what that means. Just bureaucracy. I mean, a, a commercial fishing boat has to have a vessel monitoring system, what's called a VMS for short. Right. Uh, so when that boat moves, it's got to hail out. So if you're taking your boat to go fuel up, you got to call in and say, hey, I'm going to the fuel dock. If you're going fishing, you got to say, hey, I'm going fishing. I'm going to target this species, this species, and this species, and I plan to land this IFQ species. Then when you come back in, you have to hail in and give a three-hour notice. So if, you, if your phone's not working or whatever, you cannot take that boat to the dock or you have, you have a fishery violation. You have to call in and give three hours notice so there's a lot of times there'll be a commercial boat sitting at the bell buoy or sitting offshore waiting because they made a little bit better speed than they thought etc and they cannot hit that dock until that three hours is up and they have to be at an approved landing site so you have to call in and get your landing site or your dock that you uh, depart and embark from approved so you have to tell the federal government when you're leaving when you're coming back and you have to give them three hours notice that when you're coming back so they can come and inspect and you have to go to an approved site that's accessible for the federal government to be able to come inspect and approve your catch then every single fish that comes off that boat is counted weighed and then 98 percent of the time there's an fwc or NOAA officer there doing data collection the fw or the 
commercial fishery is the gold standard of data collection when you approach fishery dependent data um, because every fish is weighed, measured, and accounted for. And they have a vessel monitoring system, so their effort is 100% tracked. That boat, anywhere it goes at any time, uh, uh, NOAA's OLE, or Office of Law Enforcement, is able to pull up that vessel and see its heading, its direction, its speed, and whether or not it's stopped or moving. And uh, they can evaluate when they fish, where they fish, and then they know exactly what they caught. And then the fisheries research that comes out of that, we have a commercial boat that lands at our dock, uh, and they uh, do otoliths on each one of the fish. They take stomach samples. They take wow. a ton of information. So Did it's this nuts. start like with the IFQs, or yes. was it like this before that? The VMS started a little bit before the IFQ, but it was a setup to make the IFQ system possible. Um, and as far as the checks and balances, weighing each fish and all that, had a lot to do with the IFQ system, and they have trip tickets. Literally, John's Pass, uh, Jason De La Cruz in the Shareholders Alliance in the Gulf of Mexico, and a few other key players in the commercial industry created this thing called Gulf Wild, and it's basically a QR code. So if you go to a place like Salt Rock Grill or you go to a high-end seafood restaurant around here, on the menu, it will tell you the boat and the captain's name of the fish that you're about to eat really? and they'll bring you the qr code and you can scan it and you can see the general area it was caught when it was caught how it was caught the gear used uh it is insane the that's ability crazy. for a guest i've or never heard of something like that yeah <laughs> that's crazy because the fish is accounted for every single one is accounted right, every for every step as it of the come way. off the boat and then when it's taken to the seafood house and sold it's accounted for again then when it comes to the restaurant it's accounted for again that trip ticket tracks that fish from the time it left the fish box to the time it made it to the seafood house to the time it made it to the restaurant and that and then to your plate yeah, that amount of red tape and uh, it's like UPS, they got to jump through. And a lot of people that aren't as educated or up to speed on our fishery <clears throat> blame commercial fishing, commercial fishermen for the death of our fishery or our short seasons or their in inability to access the fishery. When in part, the commercial fishing and the commercial fishermen and the commercial fishery uh, does a lot to provide data and uh, better fisheries management and now the commercial or that same model is being moved into the four higher recreational fleet as of october 2019 every vessel in the gulf of mexico that operates a charter boat or party boat will have a vessel monitoring system and we'll have to hail out and give notice when we're leaving and when we're coming back uh, and we have to report every fish that is caught and harvested and every fish that is caught and released so we are hoping that that accountability and that uh, ability for fisheries managers to evaluate our catch should hopefully increase our access because accountability is everything. Right now in the fishery management spectrum, they have things like the MRIP survey, which is basically a fancy way of guessing what is landing, what is caught, and how many fishermen are out there. Right now, they randomly sample a set of uni or a set of recreational anglers and then they send out a mailing list or a mailer to coastal households that ha are signed up for a fishing license a special fishing license and they take the responses from those surveys and then the random samples and they extrapolate it over a geographic region so if they talk to Sally Sue and Clearwater and John and uh, Pinellas Park and someone else down in the Skyway area, and then they sit at a boat ramp and see that uh, this boat caught X, Y, Z, this boat caught X, and this boat caught Z, then they take that information and extrapolate it as a uh, fisheries landing information and effort data for Pinellas County. And that information can be skewed sometimes uh, by people uh, biasing the data. Whereas if I'm standing on a ramp and I'm just picking off shore boats, it's going to look like we have this huge catch. Fisheries are going to close and uh, it's going to lead to overfishing and then extremely shortened seasons. It's just uh, the, the unfortunate part is it takes a lot of money to manage our fishery and a lot of uh, people and boots on the grounds. And it costs a lot of money to pay someone to do these surveys. And the recreational industry as a whole 
in Florida is enormous. There is a million, a million registered voters in Pinal- voters in Pinellas County, and every each one of those in Pinellas boats, County, yeah, and each one of wow. those boats will go out there and kill a bunch of fish and come back to a private dock. And right. it doesn't give anybody a chance to survey that boat. The only surveys that are being done are at public areas, like a public boat ramp. So how many boats go out and go fill a cooler and come back to a private dock and never get surveyed or checked? And that's the problem in the recreational industry is there's so many of them. They don't know how many people are fishing, well, and they don't know what they're catching. Wouldn't that happen in, with commercial, too? Are there any commercial boats that go Absolutely to docks that not. aren't public? Absolutely not. You have to land in what an about approved Salt Rock? landing site. You have to be an approved it's landing an approved site. Approved landing site. Yeah, and they have to give three hours notice when they're coming back to that dock. Wow. Yeah, so there's no way for a commercial fisherman to cheat the system, because their vessels are monitored. Their every action or movement of that vessel is monitored. They have to tell them when they're coming back, where they're coming back to, and it has to be an approved, accessible site for a uh, uh, fisheries management or a fisheries enforcement officer to come inspect the catch. And now in the four higher recreational industry, the 1,237 charter boats and party boats in the Gulf uh, are going to have to do the same thing. Hail out, hail in, and record every fish that's caught, every fish that's released. So that accountability is now moving into the recreational sector. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's, it goes, it, it's going in line with what they did in the commercial uh, sector. IFQs or individual fishing quota is what's called an allocation-based management. So they take the entire Gulf of Mexico's fish and the quota that you're allowed to catch, and they split it up and award it to different individuals. Like, say, Danny, you've been fishing for 10 years. You've been catching 5,000 pounds of fish a year. Mm -hmm. They're going to give you 5,000 pounds of fish, and those are your fish that you can land at Even if he doesn't go out and catch them? No, that those and that's how the IFQ system started. Is they but looked when, at landing history. How do they determine what if I caught ten thousand pounds of fish? Like, what is that based on? Is trip that, tickets. Trip, trip tickets. tickets. Yeah, from, your past. from a certain what, amount of time. Yeah, or? what you came in. I I I'm not a hundred percent sure how much yeah. time they use for the IFQ sector, but they basically took the commercial quota and split it up based on landings history and awarded it to different individuals because that's the one thing that was the most confusing to me when we were yeah. when we were um, making deck hands was trying to explain that and i had a lot of different people explain it to me pretty well um i think the best was ozzy the guy that runs save on seafood yeah um and that's what it came down to in it, the commercial yeah. fleet you had these derby seasons because there was only a certain amount of quota, and these guys were running out there and trying to fish hard and catch that quota before it closed. And it was unsafe. There was a lot of uh, problems with safety at sea. There was a lot of problems with managing that fishery. Because when like Facebook or Instagram or something. When, oh. Pull up like their Facebook or their Instagram or something. Who? Sorry, sorry, go ahead. No worries. What do it's you at want, the you bottom of their website, all the different uh, links. We got some videos or something. Yeah, there you go, bottom left. Facebook. Yeah, we got a bunch of videos. But yeah, I mean, like Shane, like the first, like the first thing that we, when we, first time we ever met up and interviewed Shane, he was the one thing that him and a lot of the other guys were extremely angry about was IFQs, and it seemed like they didn't really understand it either. It's kind of yeah. just like they felt. Like they're, people were taking their money. They're getting fucked over because they're the ones that are busting their asses, breaking their hands. And there's people somewhere sitting on a couch somewhere in New Jersey or Montana that is taking a cut of their checks. Yeah, and that's uh, ultimately what happened. I mean, again, you can love it or hate it. The IFQ system has consolidated the fishery, made it more accountable, and uh, has allowed for more safety at sea. So it's done some really good things, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's put a lot of people out of business. Because when they did that initial distribution of quota, there was a lot of guys that didn't get enough quota to survive. And a lot of the commercial fishermen took a 60% hit, 70% hit. Because if you were catching 20,000 pounds of fish, you didn't get 20,000 pounds in the initial distribution. You got like 60% of that, 40,000 pounds. And what happens is you're able to spread that out through the whole year. And a lot of people didn't get enough to survive. So intelligent guys that were prepared were able to go out there and purchase up other quota. 
So say you only got a thousand pounds of fish, you can't make a living on that. So you sell your quota to someone else. And guys went out and bought up all this allocation. Like that guy, Buddy Gwinden in Texas with that show that Big Fish Texas, he owns oh, yeah. all that red snapper. Yeah, That's what he did. He went out and bought a whole bunch of allocation. Jason Delacruz here in Madeira Beach, he mortgaged his house sold everything and went out and bought as much allocation as he could really yeah these guys right when it happened yeah these guys literally bet their lives and bet their livelihoods and bet their families on the fact that they need to try to grab as much as they can so those are the guys that are at home sitting on the couch and a lot of them don't most of them fish jason fishes every day almost Uh but he's out there all the time fishing these are not bad guys Mm -hmm. but they do own a lot of allocation, and they do have the ability to say, well, you want to go out and catch red grouper? I'll lease you some of my quota. But they get a cut of that because they get the lease price. So, for example— Because this guy's going to sell it anyways. Mm-hmm. That guy, should he should get his, his cut if he's yeah. going to lease some of his shares. So, basically, you have an allocation, and then you have shares. So, based on the total allowable catch or the uh, ultimate quota for the year— uh, you have an allocation. Your allocation is a percentage of the fishery. So, say you have five. Let's say, let's make it easy on myself. Yeah. Say you have a ten percent. Me too. My brain's <laughs> running slow. <laughs> say you have uh, a ten percent allocation. So that's the percentage of the fishery. They come out and they say, "All right, next year the total allowable catch is hundred pounds." And that's that for like the whole Gulf 10, of Mexico. Yeah. Okay. So that means you get ten pounds to catch through the year. Okay. So your shares are then those pounds. So you can go out and lease a pound of fish. Okay. Now, granted, that was a small example to keep it easy, yeah, but yeah, yeah. they can have a lot of pounds to lease out and catch themselves. So some guys will keep all their allocation for their own fish house. Like Jason has a big fish house, so he has a couple boats of his own that go out there and fish, and he puts captains and crew together, and yeah. they go out there and prosecute the fishery and bring it in. He himself has a commercial fishing boat where he goes out there and goes diving, and he, he, they they do well for themselves. It's a business, but uh, it's just like anything else. You have a it's like leasing a car. Hey, you can go out and use this car to drive Uber, but you're gonna have to pay me for each mile you drive. It's right. the same idea. Um, like red snapper, I think I want to say is like four fifty a pound is what they can sell it to a seafood house for, and the lease price is like two two twenty five a pound. So Whoa. it's almost fifty percent, yeah. And that's the problem right now with red grouper, is and that's why Shane Lee and, and Space are so upset. It's not the it's not the lease price that's killing them. What's killing them is the different fishery aspects. Right now, right now. Bobby Spath, for example, he told me he would give me red grouper quota, give it to me, because he can't sell it, because there's, there, it's too hard for them to catch. A wow. commercial fisherman has to be able to go out there and catch enough fish on that trip to cover expenses, pay their deckhands, pay the fuel bill, pay the grocery bill, cover the cost and uh, wear and tear on the boat, and then anything extra of that is split between the captain, crew, and the boat. But when red grouper is selling for two dollars a pound and you have to go out there and lease it for 25 cents 30 cents why would you go catch a fish for two dollars a pound you're going to go after that red snapper that's worth four dollars a pound are you going to go fish another fishery that you can get more money for at the fish house Mm -hmm. and here in our area we're mainly known for our red grouper and gag grouper fishery yeah Uh, and that's what our commercial fishermen live off of so shane lee and space lee being on a uh, grouper boat they're not able to catch grouper and make money with grouper because the price is so low at the fish house so it's not so much the ifq system that's hurting them as it is just the price at the fish house right. of certain species that are popular in our area and there's not a lot of red group or red snapper allocation out there to be leased and because of its popularity the price of the lease is higher yeah. whereas red grouper the price of the lease is super low because you can't make no money off them because the uh price of the fish house is so low so it's it's Why is it's it a so model low on it's a stock grouper? market because it's uh, hard to catch right now. Uh, the commercial fishermen are the ones standing at the council begging them to shut it down and cut quotas. The commercial fishermen are the ones doing it. And uh, they, there's a problem in our red grouper fishery right now, and we're not seeing as many as uh, we should, whether that's a red tide issue or a expansion of the red snapper biomass or uh, one of the many other issues in our 
a fishery uh, accounting for it or a little bit of everything. But we're not seeing the red grouper that we saw in 2009. And Is that recent with grouper? With red grouper, yes. Yeah. I mean, every fish, every uh, fishery is cyclical. You'll, you'll have these up and downs where you see a huge abundance of the biomass, and then all of a sudden you have a, a, a red tide event and heavy fishing, and all of a sudden there's not as many fish out there. And the uh, stock assessments really try to keep a handle on that, whereas what we see on the water isn't always what we see at the council. For example, with red snapper, they're deemed overfished, but there's millions of red snapper out there everywhere. That overfished designation is because of MSA or Magnus and Stevens, and that's the that's what manages our fishery. This law that the Congress made up, and uh, or that the Senate made up, and uh, it's it, it's unfortunate, but through the years it's been reauthorized or changed twice in 1996 and again in 2007 and that 2007 authorization had a lot of driving force from the environmental groups and they made it mandatory to rebuild fisheries and any fishery deemed overfish has to go under a mandatory rebuilding plan and it created these buffers like ACLs so you have an overfishing limit a stock assessment is done and they have an overfishing limit that overfishing limit is called an OFL. And let's say they, they determine through the stock assessment that you can fish to this limit. Anything higher than that, you're going to be overfishing. Anything under that, you're golden. The fishery can sustain itself. So that overfishing limit is set at, like, say, 100 pounds. Again, easy example. Well, then the Science and Statistical Committee will evaluate that and look at the scientific uncertainty in the stat, uh, stock assessment, and then they'll set a buffer to the ABC, or allowable biological catch limit. And that buffer is typically anywhere from 5 to 20%. So now you went down from 100 pounds due to this buffer for the ABC, you're at 75 pounds. Well, then the council will look at that ABC, and then they have to set an ACL which was mandatory in the 2007 reauthorization. That ACL or allowable catch limit is buffered down from the ABC to account for management uncertainty. How fast are they going to be able to account for those landings? And then in things like the red snapper fishery, where we have this huge catch and this derby fishery, there's an allowable catch target, which is another buffer that is set for management uncertainty again. So you can have 100 pounds of fish in the OFL, that's what you can catch, but all these buffers, once it's said and done, you could be down to 50 pounds. So that's the problem. And then when you exceed that 50 pounds and you land more than that, you're considered overfishing. Mm -hmm. And when you overfish a bunch of times, then you can be considered overfished, mandatory rebuilding plan. And that 100 pounds that got turned to 50 pounds under a rebuilding plan gets turned to 20 pounds. And you're required by federal law to stay in that rebuilding plan until the fi the stock is rebuilt, which okay. takes 20, 30 years. So right now, Red Snapper is in a rebuilding plan, and there's Red Snapper everywhere. And everybody agrees that Red Snapper fishing, the fishery is healthy, and there's tons of Red Snapper out there. But their their hands are tied because mm -hmm. of that rebuilding plan. And uh, luckily, they just removed that overfish designation. But that that's the problem is all these buffers and uh, the – inability for fisheries managers to react quickly to uh, trends that fishermen see on the water um, because they're bound by science-based management. They have right. to do the <clears throat> science and they have to believe the science. And we have one science center for three councils. So there's eight fishery management councils across the United States. You have uh, one up in New England, you have the Mid-Atlantic, South Atlantic, Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico, uh, South Pacific, Mid Pacific, North Pacific, and then Hawaiian Islands and Guam and all that shit. So you have all these different councils, and I, th I think I was right. I was, I know the Gulf, South Atlantic, <laughs> and Caribbean well. The other ones, I don't know. But uh, you have these eight councils, and like for example, in the Pacific, they'll have three science centers for one council, whereas in our area, the the uh, Southeast Fishery Science Center in Miami. Uh, provide stock assessment analysis for the South Atlantic Council, Caribbean Council, and the Gulf of Mexico. And they handle highly migratory sharks and coastal pelagics. So you have five different people saying, we need stock assessments on X, Y, and Z to one place. And the huge stress that it puts on that science center 
We have stock assessments. For example, right now we're using a red grouper stock assessment and they're trying to assess the stock of red grouper. And they're using data, the terminal year of the assessment is 2017. We're about to go into 2019 and they're trying to assess the fishery based on 2017 Jeez, and earlier data. Crazy. And then once the stock assessment is done in mid 2019, it's going to take another year, a year and a half for the council to agree on management decisions. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when you have a management decision made, it's based on data that's already three years old. Yeah. And that slow reaction to our uh, trends is a big problem that they're trying to address through ecosystem based management and adjusting the stock assessment process to try to make it a little bit more streamlined. The fishing industry seems extremely complicated to me. Yeah, yeah. It, does. Um, <laughs> it does. I mean, what do you think it was like before it got so complicated? Well, do you think it's better? Or, I mean, you know, a lot of people say the good old days and stuff. And, yeah. Uh, and the good old days were great. Seems, it seems extremely crazy now to the just catch old, fish. The good old days were great. I mean, we had, we had, uh, we were part of the problem. We helped over, we kill a lot of fish, yeah. a lot of fish. <laughs> Uh, Shane's and, wanted in four different states for killing fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, my grandfather has killed more fish than probably most people in the U.S. And, uh, I mean, we had trips where you'd go out there and limit out, bring the boat home, unload the fish, go out there and limit out again, come bring the boat home. Right. One thirty, or it was a 32-hour trip when my grandfather alive, was alive. Went out, limited out, came back and offloaded twice and went back out. So literally did three trips in one just because the fishing was so hot. Right. And we had trips where we loaded the, uh, the four fish boxes on the boat, loaded the uh, bathrooms, packed the shower, and then started packing galley uh, coolers full of fish because we were God, running damn. out of room. And back in the day, we had four fish boxes on that boat. Nowadays, we have two fish boxes because the fishing isn't the same and there's so many regulations, a lot of fish you have to toss back. So, uh, and back in the day, you had commercial fishing. Before uh, the late 80s, uh, you were allowed to sell recreationally caught fish. Okay. So we had, back in the 60s and 70s when we ran this trip, uh, those trips, you'd have 20 or 30 or 40 guys that would go every trip every week 365 days a year yeah they'd come in and sell their fish and they subsidized their habit and subsidized their hobby and then they also made a little bit of money so you could right. retire and fish every day for the rest of your life and you'd make money doing it not no and, more and that was if you were good and that they made that illegal in the 80s uh mid to late 80s and uh they really worked hard to root it out and we really work hard to try to uphold that uh, because we can lose our boat, we can lose our federal fishing permit, which allows us access to do what we do, and uh, they'll fine you a lot of money. And yeah. uh, they did sting operations, and they really worked hard to root all that stuff out. So it's definitely been interesting to watch evolution, even in my business, because, again, when I, when I, when I wasn't alive, my grandfather mm. was starting the company. They would kill everything indiscriminately. Yeah. They killed tarpon. They killed manatees. We had dolphins. Jesus. We had dolphins caged up. We did dolphin shows. We taught them yeah. how to do tricks. The Porpoise Pub used to have yeah. a dolphin in there Oh yeah, a yeah. long a time ago. A dolphin in a fish tank in a bar. Yeah, in the bar. And then we got to the point where we started – that's realizing fucked. all right we That's can't up. we can't kill these things we can't we can't kill this as much but it was still rampant i mean we overfished red snapper to the point of almost extinction in the gulf of mexico really? now they have come back expen exponentially but we have to adjust to that and we have to conserve our fishery and i want my grandson to be able to say well my my father had a sustainable fishery it didn't yeah. go from uh killing everything to all right now we have nothing to kill uh, and in my grandfather's lifetime, it, it came like that. I mean, yeah. black sea bass, red snapper, gag grouper at one point, a lot of these goliath grouper. There was trips where we'd come back with boatloads of Jew fish or goliath grouper. <laughs> and uh, nowadays you can't even take them out of the water. But wow. yes, they're going to change that, right? Because they're really overpopulated, I heard. Is that That's a, a whole nother podcast. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> the unfortunate part about Goliath Grouper is uh, it relates to stock assessments because they can't do an accurate stock assessment without fisheries independent data, without uh, a life cycle, without age data. And you can't get age data from a fish without killing it. Uh, they have to take the otolith, which is the ear bone out. So they cut the head open. 
dig in between the eyes, get this little tiny on a ga- or on a Goliath grouper, these 800 pound fish, this thing is smaller than the head of a pencil. And then they take it and they saw it in cross sections and put it under a microscope and it's like the rings of a tree. And you can right. count the rings and you get the age of the fish. Wow. wow. Uh, like down within a year, plus or minus, like very accurately. How long do those fish live normally? Uh, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know, but I would uh, guesstimate about, <clears throat> excuse me, about 15 yeah. to 20 years. I mean, they're pretty old fish, a big 800, 900 fish. They're pound everywhere. Fish. Every time I've ever dove in the past they're five a- years, there's been literally hundreds of jewfish yeah there's goliath grouper everywhere and it's becoming a huge problem because they eat everything and uh i mean an 800 900 pound fish has to eat a lot of food to stay uh, yeah that's how big they are yeah i've personally caught them in the 600 700 800 pound range they get to the size of like a like a volkswagen bigger Bigger. Yeah. I had a Goliath grouper nearly try to swallow me. I was what? I was spear fishing and I had a, a a fish on my belt, and this Goliath grouper came up and swallowed the fish. And as he did, it swallowed my flipper and was coming up my leg. And uh, uh, I can't say it in a podcast, but I had to take emergency action to make sure that I wasn't drowned because I did I wasn't on scuba. Well, if you're gonna fear I was for your life, of course you have to freaking kill the fish. Yeah, it's either you were the fish, right? Yeah, and it I'm wasn't gonna be me. It wasn't wow. going to be me. And I mean, these things, there's so many countless videos on YouTube of spear fishermen down there fishing and these huge fish come out of nowhere and just attack them to steal that fish. And the problem is uh, with this fish, they were deemed almost near extinction. Right. And uh, it's not, it's even above and beyond overfished. And uh, you have a bunch of environmental groups that don't want to see them open for harvest. And then also, if it was just environmental groups diving, uh, uh, divers, sport fishermen, recreational, commercial, we could all work together and uh, get that fishery open most likely. But the problem is, is the diving industry loves Goliath grouper. Because right. like you said before, every dive you go on, there's a bunch of Goliath grouper. So if I'm a diving boat and I want to sell dive trips, to go look at 20, 30, 800 pound fish is an easy dive for me. Yeah. And it's a great dive for you. So the diving industry is hugely in opposition of opening a Goliath grouper. Really? Right. And then you don't have a stock assessment because you don't, you have to have dead fish to do accurate science. Mm. So the first step that we need to do, and hopefully the FWC will do in the near future, is they need to open a scientific uh, quota or scientific allowable catch. So the scientists can go out there, kill these fish, bring them home, take them to the Florida Wildlife Research Institute and do the information and data collection that they need to create a fisheries independent stock assessment. And then we open a a lottery system like alligators, say, all right, there's gonna be 400 Goliath grouper across the state of Florida allowed to be killed. Here's the tags, enter your name here. If you win the lottery, you get a tag. And then that based with mandatory reporting so you catch that Goliath grouper, you have to call the FWC and report your catch, tell them where you're gonna be so they can send a scientist out. So now you have fisheries independent and fisheries dependent data. And after a year or two of that, they'd be able to do an accurate stock assessment, tell us how many fish there are. And I would guarantee you, there would be seriously relaxed regulation on them after they accomplish that. But the only way to do that is with FWC and everybody working together. That's the biggest problem in our fishery is it really upsets me when a commercial guy is saying, well, the recreational guys are going over their quota. That's the problem. And the recreational guy is sitting over here saying, well, that commercial guy is catching all those fish and killing everything. And that's the problem for this season. Right. And you have all this point finger pointing and blame. And the only way that we're going to succeed uh, at – bettering our fisheries management is by working together and uniting a commercial fisherman a, a for hire recreational and a private recreational fisherman have to sit at a table like this and try to reach agreements and then approach the fisheries management council and say this is what we want right. and as a unified voice it would pass with flying colors but the problem is there's no unified voice and that that is my goal is to provide an open access public fishery uh, where fishing sectors can unite and agree upon issues and hopefully all be able to prosecute our fisheries in the best way that each sector needs to uh, while having the access to do so. And at first and most importantly, preserving that fishery. That's fine. I just, I just remembered um, 
who was it? Dean from Pruitt. Save On yeah. was telling me he had a website. Mm -hmm. He was bragging. He's like, I got this really badass website. Everyone goes to it every day. It has all the, the data about the IFQs on there. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I got some hot chicks you can look at on bikinis. They're hanging out in the corner of the website. <laughs> what What is that? similar to kind of what you're talking is he trying to do the same thing i mean what what is his no, website? what's his website called uh i know there's boats and quota uh boats that's and, a real that's what it was called boats and quota yeah and that's because my friend kyle was telling me about that too he goes on there all the time kyle yeah. chevis yeah and kyle chevis and cody chevis go there to get quota because that's a place that you uh, lease quota there or what? yeah that's the idea is you, okay. you Look, yeah. buy and sell Look boats at all the hot girls oh hell outside. yeah <laughs> but this is purely for uh see if you scroll to the bottom you can see the association the gulf fishermen's association okay this is strictly commercial based because the, commercial. yes this is all about allocation and quota this is how you can lease quota like see there the yeah. prices so this is all about leasing quota. Uh, so this is not what I was uh, sure. just talking about, but this is great for the commercial fishery because right. it allows them to prosecute their fishery more. Because if you own a commercial boat and you wanna go out fishing and you don't have someone to lease you quota, you can go on this website and find a place to lease you oh, quota. Oh, okay. It's like, so a market, they, it's like a marketplace, it's, like an online it's marketplace. It's a Walmart of quota. Wow. So they own the quota. They do not own the quota. They no. they this, this allow like a, a so place. they like middlemen. It's like a Craigslist yeah. or a okay. eBay it's, for yeah. quota. Uh, exactly. I got you. Okay. Yeah. What I have is I have a, interesting a, a Facebook group called Fishermen United, and that's where I try to relay some information. But it's it's really really frustrating because anything I post turns into a he said she said or the commercial fisherman's fault and then the commercial guys start arguing with the recreational guys yeah, yeah. it seems so and divided and everyone like yeah is so and everyone opposite. points their fingers yeah. at Everyone's the other on person completely opposite side and, of the conversation and it, it seems like there's no one in the middle that you know what i mean that can yeah like, and a lot of people are in it for uh very selfish reasons and a lot of people are there to better their business better their access and they don't give a fuck about anybody else and that's not how we reach an agreement that's not how we work together that's not how we better our fishery so that is my goal but i'm i'm still new to this i started mm -hmm. going to the golf council meetings two years ago i'm still a young guy and uh I'm, you seem I'm like struggling. you know everything about the fishing industry you seem like you know you've rattled off ever more ever than that. i've ever heard about fishing in my I, life i haven't even started and, i can tell <laughs> so hey what was it like growing up a little bit then to slow it down and yeah. like being a part of the hubbards marina or like as a kid and when did you get into the business and all that yeah i mean uh, i bought my first boat when i uh just about after I turned nine years old, and you uh, bought your first boat. Yeah, yeah. at nine. Okay. I um, it took me two years. Uh, I I asked. I'm I have three sisters. I'm the only boy in the family, and uh, my sisters um, and myself were kind of raised differently, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I I asked my dad uh, when I was seven, "Hey, can I get a boat? I want yeah. I want to get a boat." And he was like, "Well, you can get a fucking job, and then you can get a boat." And uh, I, I started working all, started pretty what, much fishing? full time. No, I started first uh, doing lawn mowing. Okay. And then I uh, uh, would uh, prairie dog my sister's babysitting gigs when they were busy. <laughs> yeah. so I would uh, jump in there and uh, I did whatever I could to make a buck. Yeah. I caught, caught and sold bait on the dock. I uh, did laundry for my mom. I did babysitting. I mowed lawns, uh, whatever it took to make a dollar. And yeah. uh, I bought my first boat when I turned nine. Uh, for 980 bucks and uh how big was it it was a 17 foot carolina skiff with a nissan tahatsu 40 horse motor that broke down every time i went fishing. every time every time <laughs> yeah you could, you could count on it for one thing and that was getting you stranded <laughs> and uh it was it was a cool way to first it taught me the value of a dollar and the value and work yeah. ethic and uh you're not you don't you don't appreciate something as much, in my opinion, if someone just buys it for you. If you go Definitely. out there and work your ass off and earn it, it's uh, very different. And yeah. It was really cool uh, for me looking back. When I was there, I hated my dad for making me go out and work and do all this stuff. But, I mean, looking back, it, it taught me a lot about life. And right. uh, it was cool. And I, I used that boat for a lot of crazy shenanigans you still have it my friends uh, i just sold it uh about two years ago okay um but yeah i didn't want to sell it but uh, yeah. uh 
I, I used it mo- ma- uh, mostly to keep making money. I, I used it to catch uh, bait and sell bait. I got a commercial fishing license uh, for saltwater products, which was the ability to catch pinfish and sell them At to what people. age? Uh, nine. At nine years old, yeah. you did that. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, so it was, it was really cool to uh, be able to go out there after school and make a buck uh, on my boat. Uh, and I really was kind of introverted in that aspect because I was just only interested in going out in the boat. And then, uh, I got a little older and kind of got a little bit out of, out of the, uh, industry, out of the business and, uh, started doing things kids do and playing video games and, and acting crazy. And, uh, through high school wasn't as involved, but then towards the end of high school started getting back into it and, uh, working on the boats in summer and, uh, just addicted to fishing. I I have Mm -hmm. been since I was a kid and, um, in college, uh, or I guess back up to mid high school, uh, I started getting back into the fishery. I, I, I said that wrong. I started getting back into the fishery in like ninth grade, like, uh, end of middle school. And I, I worked full time nearly at the marina after school and on the weekends and on the summer. And then, uh, when I turned 16, my dad fired me. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, it was for nothing less, uh, nothing other than, uh, he wanted me to go work for someone else and see what it was like to work for someone else. Cause yeah. when he was growing up, him and his family, they just w- expected to work in the family business. Right. And they, they that was their thing and they they did so a lot he and watched a lot of people like that <laughs> yeah he watched his family's his his brother and sister's mistakes and mm-hmm. he felt that some of his family members worked in the family business just for the validation from their father and um he didn't want to do that he wanted yeah. to make sure that i knew what it was like to work for someone else uh learn what a good manager looks like and a bad manager looks like and and learn my own life experiences and uh it was really cool again hated him at the time for it but looking back it was a very intelligent wise thing to do and it enabled me to go different places and do a different thing and see if that's what i wanted to do because i i went to school in orlando purely for the fact that i wanted to get away from the water and see what it was like somewhere else right yeah like two weeks into school i started bass fishing for the first time because i couldn't sit in orlando and not fish yeah so uh after three years of school i was uh man or i was uh majoring in business management with a minor in hospitality management with the mindset of i'm going to go to school for four years and i'm going to come back and and tackle this business stuff and uh my plan was to come back from school be a deckhand become a work up to be and becoming a captain and then step into the office role uh and learn the office part of the business but uh things take turns you know yeah in life you can't make plans and uh I ended up uh, getting in my senior year of college I was a bouncer in college uh, so I spent a lot of time at the bar and uh, chasing girls and stuff I ended up yeah. meeting my wife uh, at a bar she was drinking underage and <laughs> caught her drinking underage and told her I wouldn't kick her out she gave me her number and there you go <laughs> seven years later we're married <laughs> oh, that's awesome and uh, it just it got to a point where I I wasn't uh, focused on school and I wanted to get home and uh, ended up yeah. uh, finishing with an AA and a minor in hospitality management but didn't finish my BA I was like eight credits shy <laughs> yeah and uh, came home did what I wanted to do like I said I wanted to become a deckhand then a captain then learn the office side of things but I was uh, super into weightlifting and being a crazy kid and uh I ended up hurting my back really bad uh, doing something stupid on the boat. So after like three years of working full or two years of working full time as a deckhand after college, uh, this injury occurred and uh, it pretty much sidelined me. So it took me off the boat, had to go through serious back surgery. Once recovering from that, I couldn't go do what I wanted to do and be a deckhand and I couldn't be on a boat. So I started working in the office uh, as a reservationist, just answering phones and doing grunt work. and. Then I became a manager, and then I slowly became the general manager, and then I slowly became the vice president. And now I'm the vice president, co-owner of the company, and pretty much handle operations completely. Kicked my dad out of the office, and uh, I enjoy it. And yeah. I ended up being pretty good at it. And um, Yeah, you seem like you're very good at it, from what <laughs> I could see so far. <laughs> and it, it's I really enjoy uh, – my grandfather, everybody always says how cool of a guy he was and how he uh, was so nice and outgoing and talkative and – uh, I really enjoy talking to people. You you get someone new from out of town, 
talk to them, get them hooked up, what to do for their vacation, and and see that progression of them coming into town, knowing nothing. Now they know how to fish. They're hooked on fishing, and they want to come back next year and fish with us at Hubbard's Marina. And then I get a lot of enjoyment out of that. And so now, um, after moving into the office, uh, originally when my, my back injury occurred, I, I was slow to get back on the boats. But after two two and a half years or so, I was finally back to being healthy and I started working yeah. on the boats again and ended up getting my captain's license when I was 22 you have to be 21 to get that license okay. and I waited till I was yeah. 22 and uh, went out and got the license and started running boats when I was about 23 uh, so it's been about five years or so and uh, it's it's been fun it's a lot of fun to work in the office and talk to people and get people on the boat and it's a lot of fun to take them out on the boat too and uh watch that full range uh and full progression but mm -hmm. nowadays i struggle just to be able to uh have time to breathe um, yeah but it's a, a very in my opinion a great blessing to be as busy as i am and uh balancing my home life with my wife and uh, hopefully kids in the future and balancing my life at work balancing operations and then trying to get out in the boat and then mm -hmm. also now i travel with the golf council i'm i go to all council meetings so that's five week long meetings every year at five different golf states so uh, every two to three months i'm gone for a whole week in another state at these meetings and then a lot of times they'll have other meetings like stock assessment meetings uh ap meetings and all these other meetings that i have to attend so I'm at these meetings 30, 40, 50 days a year uh, while trying to manage my office and uh, business. And it, it's it's been a challenge, but it's it's something I love to do. And I'm passionate about fishing. I'm passionate yeah. about uh, fisheries management and fishery yeah. preservation and also getting people hooked on fishing. So that's cool. I'm blessed to do what I love. You, right, you, right. you do what you love and you're never going to work a day in your life. And right. I, I, sometimes it feels like work occasionally, but most of the time it's what I love. Are your siblings wow. as involved as you are? Your sisters in the business and everything? Or? Uh, I mean, up until two years ago, no, not at all. But uh, uh, they all have their own uh, their own thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, one sister started her own business and was an entrepreneur while traveling the world. One sister was uh, in Washington, D.C., making waves, rubbing shoulders with congressmen and everybody, you know, yeah. and uh, was in a really powerful uh, position as a fundraiser. Uh, and now she came back and she's working with us. Uh, uh, she helped my dad work with city management to get uh, waterborne transportation in our area. Uh, a reality and uh that was pretty cool to see that and it's great to work with family yeah um, besides my family my direct family <clears throat> my my cousin uh is the captain on one of the boats my other cousin uh works at our uh boat building uh operation and helps us build boats and then i have other cousins that work in our family's restaurant um and it's it's nice to be able to work with family it's really really tough sometimes but yeah I it's, bet. it's rewarding mm -hmm. I like it. You, you were saying that you go to um, multiple different states on in the Gulf, surrounding the Gulf, um, to deal with like conserving the fisheries and maintaining the fisheries and stuff. Um, Dean was telling me he was when I years ago when I filmed that a couple years ago when I filmed that he was showing me pictures and showing me an article about how he had traveled to Washington D.C. multiple yeah. times. Um, I don't know if that was. It had anything to do with the fisheries, or if that was specifically about quotas and like the it IFQs. was probably for the IFQ system because the IFQ system was driven and funded by the Environmental Defense Fund, an NGO, environmental NGO, and their uh, idea behind it was consolidation and more accountability. Okay. So anything like that, the environmental groups are going to get behind. So the yeah. EDF, Pew, a bunch of these environmental groups helped fund these fishermen mm -hmm. and create this idea of this program. And then they funded those fishermen to go lobby for this program. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of guys spent a lot of time lobbying congressmen, senators, yeah. and uh, everybody to try to accept the system. And most people involved in the process were on board for IFQs. Some had different ways of going about it. I'm not a commercial fisherman, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm speaking on this based on things that I've talked to other commercial fishermen about. Uh, but 
you can't argue with the result of accountability, right. safety at sea, and uh, consolidation. It did what it's supposed to do. Now mm -hmm. that call consolidation is terrible for the people that got consolidated. Because <laughs> again, we went from 500 boats in Madeira Beach to 50 boats. Yeah. And that is a lot of lost livelihoods, a lot of yeah. lost businesses, a lot of lost people. Right. And uh, you take a guy like Shane Lee and take away his job, what's going to happen to him? Nothing good. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, they, they themselves say that you can't do anything else. You can't get a job anywhere else. You can yeah, be a deckhand. Right. Yeah. I mean, look look at that. I mean, you can't go get a job at Kinko's. I mean, you know, right. you, you can't go get a job at McDonald's. Right. Uh, go be a deckhand. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it really has unfortunately caught a lot of people up in that system. Because even both guy, of them aren't even fishing now. Deckhands like that weren't at these council meetings. They didn't know right. what was coming. It was one day a light switch got turned on and their whole life got turned upside down. So, it. You think uh, that's fair for them, or is it just kind of it is what I, it is? I I can't speak to that. You know, I mean, I don't think it was fair. A uh, fairness is all in your perception. Right. That that question it really has to do with your viewpoint and what. Uh, what your point of view is i mean was it fair to the environmental groups yeah i mean they got their consolidation accountability and everything worked out was it fair to the people who were at that meeting that knew oh shit, i gotta go save a bunch of money and sell my house and leverage everything and gamble my whole life on getting a bunch of allocation worked out for them but it could have gone the other way too and uh it it just all in your perception i mean mm -hmm. If if you're motivated, involved, you can you can use it selfishly, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but I try to really share what happens. Like for example, we have this electronic reporting thing that I'm telling you about earlier, mm. and how next year I have to have a vessel monitoring system. And I worked with uh, an environmental group to hold a meeting here to educate my fellow uh, charter boat and party boat guys because right now there's a uh, there's a program where you can sign up and become a volunteer and get a free $3,000 unit. Mm -hmm. But you have to get off your ass, show up to a meeting, learn what it's about, and get that $3,000 unit. And or you can wait till next year. Don't want to do that. They'll complain. Oh, I didn't get a they'll fucking They'll wait till free next unit. year and then they'll you bitch that they in, have to bitch. spend. Yeah. Smoke too much weed, Shane. You didn't show up. <laughs> yeah. And now I got to pay three grand. Stop just, bitching. And I'm scared to even go out and fish in the backyard now after all this <laughs> talk about all that. I'm not well, even catching federal nothing fisheries no more. Management, not state management. So, <laughs> yeah. state water. And that's another confusing thing is everything we're talking about applies to federal fishing. So right. federal fishing starts at nine miles. If you're fishing inside, oh, of yeah, nine I don't miles, even make it past the sandbar. Yeah, so I've never FWC. even been out on a boat like that at all. Oh, we can change or diving or anything. I don't know. It sounds <laughs> we'll crazy. We'll, we'll you told out. me you almost got eaten by a, a 600 pound fish. I'm pretty good, bro. <laughs> Well, yeah. that's spear fishing. That's it's a little crazy. different. I mean, it is crazy that sh both Shane and Space aren't fishing anymore. Yeah. And Shane is doing like some crazy thing where he was showing us pictures. He's doing red tide cleanup. He drives on these yeah. like these boats that have ATVs on them, and these boats pull up on the beach and they drive the ATVs off the boat, mm -hmm. docked onto the sand, and they drive up and down like mile long strips of the beach and pick up dead fish. He said that's yeah. all he does. He says he makes a ton of money doing it. Yeah. Right and he now, wouldn't let us talk about that on the podcast, by the way. So yeah, I don't yeah. know why he didn't want. I don't know. Well, they don't want people to know about it because right now you can uh, the red tide cleanup. They're just pouring money into cleaning up red tide, which is interesting and it's really cool because they right, have. There's done a lot of money in going into it. You can make seventeen dollars a day as a complete. You can be a triple felon, three time loser, and you yeah. can go out and get a job making seventeen dollars an hour, not a day. I apologize. Yeah, I was gonna say that was seventeen dollars an hour. And then if you're a deckhand on a boat, you can get $20 an hour. And then if you're a captain on the boat, you can get $30 an hour plus $250, day, $250 a day for your boat. To clean up to the clean red tide. Up. So there's a lot of guys that using their charter boats quit charter fishing to do red tide clean cleanup. Up. And if you do $250 an hour, if you make $30 an hour, work a 12-hour day, and you get $250, bucks, that's a for your big boat, paycheck. Right. That's yeah. big. Yeah, and uh, I mean, if you're a, a, a felon that's flipping burgers at McDonald's or you can't get a job anywhere else like Space and uh, uh, Shane, going and make $17 an hour to walk the beach and pick up dead fish is a killing. Yeah. And you do that for Hell 12 yeah. hours a day, and they've been doing it for almost two months. So, I mean, they're just bankrolling. And 
it's it, the red tide cleanup has been very lucrative for the people involved in it, but there's only a very small minority involved, and it was very hush hush. Yeah, he was like so uh, they they wouldn't let him talk about, about the names of the companies after. and like yeah. they don't want to be advertised who they're working for because it's so much money and involved. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if you don't show up for work and there's a line out the door of people waiting for work, you're gonna lose your job if you don't show up. Yeah, but if no one knows about it no one knows how to get involved in it then you have a little bit of job security and right now they gotcha. are at, when it first happened they hired a bunch of people and then they were firing people who weren't working as hard and hiring new people because there were so many people waiting in line but nowadays there's not as many people waiting in line so you can <laughs> relax and fuck off you don't have to work as hard and you're not going to get fired yeah. so it's they, they don't want to they don't want to advertise it for that reason in my opinion and it seems like it's, they're dumping a ton of money into a band-aid right i mean they're just dumping a ton of money into picking up fish and throwing them in a dumpster. I mean, you could to make it you look think clean. that they could put their money somewhere else to try to stop it at the source, maybe. Yeah, Red Tide has been around since Forever. Uh, the 1500s. There's right. actually documented <clears throat> from back in the Spanish days uh, where the Gulf was red and the Gulf was dead. There's nothing in the Gulf. I mean, that was like legit thing from like Columbus era. era. In the 60s and 70s, we had huge Red Tides. But long story short, it's always around. I was talking to a Pinellas County red tide expert who's been doing red tide sampling in Pinellas County three times a week, 365 days a year for the last 15 years. And he's never taken a sample that didn't have a red tide organism count to it. Right. So it's always here. But when you have nutrients present and you have a mature, concentrated bloom, you have fish kills. And so... Right now, we have a lot of nutrients in the water from all the municipalities growing out of control and all this new concrete and all these toilets that our sewer systems can't overflow. Like St. Pete has a sewage overflow like every oh, yeah. month. And so all that sewage with all this red tide and all this hot water that's blooming, these concentrated blooms of mature cells, uh, just it's like throwing lighter fluid on a fire and then it right. just explodes. So <clears throat> as far as what your question was or what your statement is putting a Band-Aid on it, well, if you kill a million pounds of fish and you have that million pounds of fish sitting along the seashore in shallow hot water, that decomposing fish is a lot of nutrients. So the idea is you pick up all the dead fish in the water oh, and take okay. them out of the water. You're not only fixing the smell and... Uh, helping to stem the hurt to the tourism industry, but you're also taking those nutrients out of the water and taking that decomposition and rotting fish out of the water. So that's the idea behind it. Not so much a Band-Aid, but it's preventative in a way if you look at it and kind of squint and turn your head. Yeah. But it's also, a, in my opinion, a tourism thing. Uh, right, Pinellas sure. County, we're 100% tourism driven. And right. uh, if, you if you're surrounded on all three sides by rotting dead fish, fish car right, you don't want to you're come not going to get tourists yeah, into yeah. the area so right, yeah. uh it's it's to help get the dead fish out of the water but it's also to help keep people on the beach i heard that it was the the runoff from the um pesticides like in the middle of, of florida near like okeechobee and yeah i mean it didn't that. help i mean the this red tide started back in october 2017 behind irma Irma had all that uh, heavy mm -hmm. rain and craziness down there, and this red tide uh, occurred around south of Fort Myers, north of Everglades City, and it started in October 2017. Yeah. And then we moved into spring, water got hotter, and then these discharges started happening, and as the water got hard, it, you could argue that the water just got warmer and it allowed the bloom to grow. Right. But, I mean, if you have a smoldering... You have a smoldering fire over here and you take a can of lighter fluid and dump it on it it's right. going to explode and that was the in my opinion uneducated fishermen uh if you have this discharge of all this fresh water because when you lower the salinity algae can grow much better so just allowing fresh water into the gulf is going to create more red tide and help a red tide that's already there grow bigger Adding then fresh water yes when you lower the salinity uh I, plants yeah. can grow better okay. algae can grow better okay. red tides and algae so okay. then you take that fresh water that you're dumping into the gulf of mexico and you add a bunch of nutrients to it whether that's phosphate or whatever other chemicals and runoff 
sewage, all those sewage. septic lines along the Caloosahatchee and St. Lucie and Okeechobee River and uh, Okeechobee Lake, all those sewage pipes, all the runoff from the sugar industry, there's multiple different causes. Right. And then you take this blue-green algae that we cause that's man-made. It's not naturally occurring like red tide. Right. And that blue-green algae is a freshwater algae. It does not occur in fresh salt water, and any salt water kills it. So it's okay. just like the dead fish. You take all this algae, all these nutrients, all this fresh water, and you dump it into salt water. Well, the algae dies and rots, which mm -hmm. causes more nutrients. Fresh water allows it to grow better. And then all the nutrients is just like lighter fluid. So this whole thing huh. started in the springs, and it hit that mature. Because, again, remember, you need nutrient-rich water, mm -hmm. and you need mature cells. So you had these mature cells that had been around for four or five months mm -hmm. and are old and badass. And then huh. you pour a bunch of uh, nutrients into the water and boom, we have a huge, nasty huge red tide mountain. event yeah. that slowly moved north uh, and got worse and worse and worse. So, Is this the worst you've seen it? Uh, no, 2005 no. was a much worse red tide. It was Yeah, I've seen it way worse too, just surfing around here, mm -hmm. like being in the water. Like I remember in past years, like literally having my eyes burning so now, bad and this year i mean i've been out in the water in the, in the past three or four months and it has at least in pinellas county mm -hmm. and it hasn't been that bad and now you have to also take into account that this is the first time they've ever picked up dead fish in 2005 there was no oh. red tide cleanup so the, those fish died and just sat there and rotted yeah uh now this year they're picking them up and what you said as far as your eyes uh, watering and stuff like that. That's a red tide symptom. That's the brevitoxin that's released when red tide gets really bad and, okay. and passes away. And so that symptom is cured because we've had a lot of east wind. That east wind pushes all those uh, brevitoxin off the coast and you don't have any effect. Okay. Uh, so you could be surfing and you're not going to cough and gag and have itchy, watery eyes, okay. you know? Uh, and then a lot of people equate dead fish with red tide. If I see a dead fish float, oh, there's red tide there. Yeah. Uh, no. Not always. A dead right. fish, at, when a fish dies, it sinks. Yeah. And then it rots, decomposes, the gaseous buildup in that fish makes it float. So when you see a fish floating, it was dead two days ago, three days ago. Right. And most of the fish you see are rotten. So they've yeah. been dead for a week. So you see this huge bloom of uh, dead fish, and the news crews are out there saying, oh, red tide's so bad. Yeah. That's not fucking yeah. red tide. Right. That's a symptom of red tide. Good news. They go scoop up yeah. every yeah. fish they can find, bury themselves in. I fucking watched <laughs> yeah. them do it, In bro. Mike Concho's backyard. I was, I was, yeah, in Mike Concho's I was, I was doing a red tide interview two or three times a day for like three weeks straight when this whole thing starts yeah. on the news. And I watched the news crews zoom in on these on right. these four dead fish. And <laughs> I mean, Fox 13, when this thing first started, there was just a few dead bait fish, but we had a really strong new moon tide. Yeah. And that new moon tide was flushing all this water out of the pass. So whenever you have these heavy tides, yeah. natural, when there's no red tide around, you have a big defined line. The bay water will be dark brown and black sometimes right. if we have heavy rains. Mm -hmm. and the Gulf water will be greenish blue or sometimes just blue. So Fox 13 was flying over this brownish black water meeting this blue water. And on the edge of that, when there's no red tide, there's a bunch of debris and foam and sea life. Yeah. And, and they were flying over this with a few dead fish scattered in. Obviously, there was some red tide fish kill, but it was very minor. And they're flying over it saying, look at the water that's pouring, the toxic water pouring into the Gulf, when in reality it was completely natural with a very minor fish kill. That's ridiculous. And that, that, that unfortunate... Um, sensational journalism really hurt us mm -hmm. and then it made national news and national news all they said is the coast of florida the west coast of florida is engulfed with toxic tide right. and toxic tide this toxic tide that yeah. and all they would ever say is the west coast of florida or the southwest coast of florida mm -hmm. they never said i mean from march until july it was all south of Sarasota County. There was nothing in Anna Maria, Johns yeah. Pass, in the Tri-County area. But yeah. we were ostracized yeah, we're close and politicized to into it mm -hmm. that we were wrapped into it. And we started feeling the effects uh, with lower head counts and less yeah. people in the area. And then when it actually hit here, I mean, it was just like, 
it was like heyday. I mean, people came from all over to take video and say how bad Pinellas County really? was, and then it just went to shit. I mean, September is a slow month, but this past September was terrible. Yeah, how much did it affect your business? The our business, I mean, our <clears throat> red tide has zero effect on our offshore fishing business. Okay. Even in 2005 when red tide was at the worst, right. when it was 15, 20 miles out, you've just fished beyond it. And the you fish are healthy, the you can tide. still eat even them. The, even that, though, like a couple of my friends that um, run commer they commercially pull, like, pull and sell stone crabs, like my friend RJ, um, he's been getting more crabs than he's gotten in the past couple years. He Red said. Tide and does a been few bigger. Red Tide does a few things, and one thing that it, it does do is it increases the uh, shrimp and crab harvest the following year. Why? It actually increases the catchability because uh, Red Tide is like a wall, and that wall was traveling north, pushing all these crabs in front of it. Oh. So now all these guys are fishing ahead of that wall of Red Tide, and they're catching more crabs more quickly, more easily. No and fucking And the way. same thing in 2014. We had some of the best red grouper catches we've ever had because this epicenter of red grouper population was hit with red tide, and it pushed all those grouper into this structure. We were out there. I mean, some commercial guys were having nine, ten thousand 10,000-pound trips <clears throat> where a normal trip is 2,000, 3,000 pounds. So it was literally tripling yeah. the catch rate and catchability of these fish. Yeah. So red tide... I mean, we saw in uh, early September as the red tide kind of pushed into our area, we got a huge push of gag grouper. We we're catching monster gags at a time of year where you don't see gags that big, that close to shore. It really makes fish move because most fish can move out of the way of it. I mean, I see it in John's Pass all the mm -hmm. time. What the depending on the wind and the current, we'd have beautiful, clear, crystal clear water filled with fish. Yeah. The next day would be blood red. Everything's dead. Yeah. But towards the end of the red tide, once it had been around for one or two weeks, you didn't see fish kills. It's not because all the fish were dead. Because one day it'd be crystal clear, fish are everywhere. The next day it's red and there's no dead fish because these fish are learning and they adapt to their surroundings mm -hmm. and they can go up into Long Bayou or Cross Bayou and way up there in the mouth of the rivers and these uh, estuaries where red tide hasn't affected and can't okay. affect because red tide is salt water. Mm -hmm. okay. Estuaries are okay. mainly freshwater. The salinity is too low for red tide to affect it. Well, I've been eating a ton of fish and a ton of stone crabs locally lately. Does it taint I'm the still, fish? I'm still alive, so. Yep. Do you it think does it not attain the, the crabs fish. or anything. Uh, shellfish in red tide affected areas can cause uh, a serious injury or, or death to a human, but you have to eat a lot of it and you have to have a bioaccumulation of brevitoxin. A fish, the muscle of the fish or the fillet that we eat is 120,000% safe from the worst red tide affected areas. Uh, and that's straight from Florida Wildlife Research Institute. I mean, fish are safe and healthy to eat. But you're saying it's safe to go in the water. Fuck you up? Shellfish, that's oysters, a shellfish, right? No, no. That's a uh, crustacean. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, shellfish <laughs> like oysters, clams, that kind of stuff. Oh. Yeah. If okay. you went and ate an oyster out of a red tide affected area, well, one probably wouldn't make you too sick, but you might throw up. But if you, a ate a, if you ate a couple <laughs> dozen of them, you'd fucking die. Jeez. Yeah. Because they're filter feeders, and they right. they filter okay. all that stuff out, okay. and that's that's what they they just suck that's in what all they that do, toxin. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, but after a few months, that that uh, bioaccumulation level has worked through their body, and mm -hmm. they're safe right. to eat again. So okay. it's not like it ruins the right. area and just <laughs> makes them unhealthy to eat in red tide affected right. areas. Right. But the fish are healthy, the crabs are healthy, and we're catching plenty of fish. You just got to get out and on the boat and try it and get mm -hmm. past it. Yeah. Because even our shortest, closest to shore trip is well past the red tide affected area. Mm -hmm. Wow, man. I learned a lot today. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, fishing is very, uh, very, <laughs> very intense industry, man. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that but, goes into it, and it's as intense as you want it to be. Yeah. You go out there and soak a line, drink a beer, and have a good time, or you can get really involved and stake your livelihood on the fishery, and then you have to get a little bit more intense. Yeah, yeah it's cool. It's cool to see you at 27 so knowledgeable about it and so respectful of the industry and the fisheries and everything. And yeah. I appreciate you coming out. And, You're doing and a lot, man. That's yeah, cool. and, really I appreciate and it. taking care Thank of the community you. and, you know, at trying to educate as many people as you yeah. can. There's a lot of cool resources out there. I mean, myself, 
Uh, like I said, I only got into this two years ago, and I didn't really honestly know that much. I mean, I grew up uh, listening to my dad, and my dad is a really good businessman, and he's a really good at what he does. But when it comes to science and all that, is not not as not, uh, so. not as not his strong suit. But sure. uh, he he joined organizations and listened to other people, and uh, I grew up around some really sensationalized, uh, really heavy duty agenda driven individuals and i was kind of had a warped view of the fish a very one-sided biased view yeah. of the fisheries management system so getting involved in the process and kind of learning all the players and their teams and their agendas was really eye-opening for me and i yeah. i really take advantage of the resources that are there like w my favorite thing that i've done is the marine resource education program it's a three-day workshop twice a year so it's six days total you go through that six day work, those six days, and you graduate that marine resource education program. You're gonna have a, in, it's like going to fisheries management college in six yeah. days. It's really, really cool, and it was very eye opening for me. And I've been blessed to do it twice. So going through that twice has really, really taught me a lot. And then just doing my research. So it's really cool. But I, I definitely uh, appreciate the compliments. But it's all yeah, due to the people that I've been blessed to surround myself with. Cool. That's awesome, well, man. check out the Hubbard's Marina and the website and uh, what you got a YouTube show. Yeah, right? yeah, we have uh, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. I run all our social media and online marketing myself. So when you message our page, you message me directly. Cool. And uh, we do a live fishing show every Sunday night at 830 p.m. for an hour. Uh, the first half is where we show photos and videos of what we've been doing that week. Second half is where we answer our guests uh, and viewers' uh, questions live on air. Is that and on Facebook or YouTube? Facebook and YouTube. We okay. stream to seven channels at once. So we stream. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. it's pretty cool. And we yeah. can do the screen shares. It's it's gotten pretty advanced. Uh, awesome. Yeah, and then I do a radio show every two radio shows every weekend, and then I have a Bass Pro seminar every week or every month. Damn. Yeah. Damn. You, you got it busy. all going, can man. Give you a healthy dose of Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Cool, man. Well, thank you for coming on, Dylan. Hey, yeah, no man. problems. We'll remember catch up with you soon. Yep. You got to remember the family motto if you're too busy to go fishing, you're just too darn busy. <laughs> all, all right. right. Man. Amen. We'll see if you can get me to catch a fish sometime, man. Oh, for sure. <laughs> no all right. problem. <laughs> all right, bro. Thank you.